going to miss seeing everybody day after day, but I think it's been a good conference so far, at least for us. I'm hoping everybody else feels the same way. Yesterday, we were focused on governance issues from board to engaging volunteers. Today, we will explore how to create sustainability within our nonprofit organizations, something I know everyone here is seeking to achieve. I want to remind everybody that all the conference materials, including the videos of the sessions, will be available in the State Resource Center uh, on the Kids Chance website following the conference. And again, our, our um, video coordinator, technology coordinator, Linda, is in the back of things. If there's any problem, she will be periodically posting things in the chat box that you need to know. Um, she's been integral to keeping our conference on track and supporting our, the materials from our speakers and our videos. So I just wanna give Linda uh, another thank you. Mission accomplished, Linda. We will wrap up uh, the final day today with a look at building sustainability and nonprofit organizations and supporting them with healthy and diversified funding models. When we talk about healthy nonprofits, it can't avoid the term sustainability. Sustainability is commonly used to describe a nonprofit capable of nurturing itself over the long term and perpetuating its ability to fulfill its mission. Along with planning and leadership, effective fundraising strategies and community engagement are pivotal elements in achieving long-term sustainability of a nonprofit organization. Today's speakers are truly uniquely positioned to help us learn what it will take to become sustainable. So I'm glad you're all here and I'm hoping you're gonna stay for the benefit of all three sessions. But first, let me thank our conference sponsors. As you know, and as I have been sharing day after day, we really could not do this without the help of our sponsors. On behalf of Kids Chance and all of our volunteers, I wanna thank our conference sponsors for their support and their participation in making the 2021 virtual conference a real success. In this virtual world, it is wonderful to have the generosity of so many conference sponsors who provide the support we need to bring all of you together around the conference. Sponsors, your involvement is vital. So thank you so much for supporting this year's conference. Now we're going to move into a student spotlight. This will be the fifth in a series of student testimonials we have been sharing throughout the conference, produced by our good friend, Bob Wilson. Today, we will hear from Ethan Ballard, a scholarship recipient from Kids Chance of California, who has experienced the loss of a parent to a workplace incident. Let's hear his story. Hi, and welcome to this edition of Student Spotlights. Today, we are joined by Ethan Ballard, who comes to us from Kids Chance of California. He's a scholarship recipient from that, uh, that great organization. Ethan, thanks for joining us today. Um, Ethan, why don't you take a second, if you could, and just give us a quick history of what brought you to Kids Chance and, uh, and, and, um, and the impact that that may have made in, in your life, if you could. In 2004, my dad passed away during a training. He was a police officer for Pasadena, and they were training for a Vegas to Vegas marathon race. So it's a race the department and other departments compete in, compete in, and it's a relay race. So one person runs a certain segment, and another person, they're passing a baton. So they go from Bakersfield in California all the way to Las Vegas. So he was training for a run right around the Rose Bowl, and he had a cardiac arrest around the roses so that that happened in 2004 and by then i was or sorry 2006 2006 because i just turned four he died in february so from there my mom had to raise me and my three brothers alone and well i think she did a good job of that she helped me through pretty much through my whole life i'm currently going to cal poly pomona and i'm studying aerospace engineering i was given five thousand dollars for two semesters so a total of ten thousand dollars and that means I don't have to worry about the price of books. I don't have to worry about food. I don't have to worry about gas or anything. So if a class says you need this textbook and the textbook is only available in like a hard copy and you have to buy it new, it, it sucks to have to buy it new because it's expensive. 
but because of the kids chance of California and them giving me that scholarship, I don't have to worry about it. Like I have the money and I don't have to ask my mom or uh, get a second job or anything. Thank you, Ethan, for sharing your story and good luck and best wishes in the upcoming um, student year. I think these testimonials have really added a, a piece of um, our mission to the conference. And again, Bob, thank you so much for taking the time. I know Cheryl Doucette was also integral in putting these together for us. I wanna also move into thanking today's keynote sponsor um, because again, without our sponsors, we would not be able to do this. I wanna take an opportunity to thank uh, Select Medical. The mission of Select Medical Corporation is to ensure high quality healthcare and cost-effective outcomes by providing specialty inpatient long-term acute care and rehabilitation and outpatient rehabilitation services to those we serve while providing a positive work environment for staff and a reasonable return to our shareholders. Thank you, Select Medical, for making today's keynote possible. Now let me introduce our speaker. I am so pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker, a nonprofit professional whom I admire, Sheila Bravo. Sheila is president and CEO of Dana, a nonprofit membership organization whose mission is to strengthen, enhance, and advance nonprofits and the nonprofit sector in Delaware through advocacy, training, capacity building, and research. Sheila joined Dana as president and CEO in August 2015. She is the former executive director of the Rehoboth Art League in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Her professional experience spans nonprofit, for profit, and academia. She began her career in advertising, then in brand leadership positions, launching new project products, um, brands such as Blastic Pickles, Godiva Chocolatier, Corel, Corel Dinnerware, Corningware, Ovenware, got that, and Pyrex Bakeware. She transitioned to provide strategic planning, new product, and leadership of consulting services to mid-sized companies and nonprofit organizations in a variety of industries. Her work led her to pursue a, pursue a doctorate in leadership, specializing in nonprofit governance from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Sheila is certainly an expert in what makes nonprofits sustainable. Sheila, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to hearing what you have to say, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Vicki, and uh, hi, everybody. It's uh, great to be here, and um, I know that I'm just uh, one of a few more folks that are uh, between you and your weekend, so I hope to um, provide some uh, meaningful information today, and I'm going to share my screen briefly here. Hold on a second. Grab that. And I, fair warning, uh, during the presentation, I am going to ask some questions. Um, and Linda has been kind enough is going to help me um, with uh, some polling. So um, just know that uh, that is going to be trying to get rid of the, is there a way to get rid of this? All right. Trying to. Can you see that, Linda? I guess yeah, are you go, are you full screen? I'm. Uh, I think that's probably what's happening here. It works great when we practiced it before everyone got here. I know. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. There we go. That's better. Yeah. All right. Oh, we can't see you now. We can't see it now. Screen sharing has stopped. Okay. Apologize, folks. How's that? There you go. Great. Okay. Um, so let's get started. Um, Vicki was kind enough to give an overview of, um, of the topic today. And uh, I know that this is a fundraising module. And so I'm not going to, um, fundraising is certainly an important part of sustainability, but I wanted to provide you with a broader perspective. 
And um, one of the things that I also wanted to offer for you today is not just what are the elements of sustainability, but how can you take advantage of some of the resources that are out there and available for you to work on um, some of those sustainability practices. Uh, Vicki uh, did a nice job uh, mentioning um, uh, who my organization is. I do wanna say that Dana is not unique. There is a state nonprofit association in almost every state in the country. And a lot of them have similar services and resources that Dana provides. So uh, if you find something here that you would really like some extra help with or get access to resources that might be specific to your state, you can visit the National Council of Nonprofits and they will have a list of your state association in your area. So to begin with, um, my first question would like to get your thoughts on whether or not you should lead a nonprofit like a business. And Linda's gonna put up the poll and would appreciate if you could answer it. Have we gotten the responses, Linda? They're still coming in. Okay. Got a few more people. Looks like they've sort of stopped. I think we're ready to share. There so we what go. did we come up with? So almost two thirds say yes. And then it looks like it's fairly split between no and not sure. Okay. Thank you for that. I am actually not going to give you the answer yet, but um, when I go through today's presentation, um, just keep that in the back of your head um, because um, I might ask it again. Right, so stepping back and just thinking about why nonprofits exist, it really gets into you know, the, the sustainability conversation. So first and foremost, um, a lot of our communities have barriers and opportunities for those individuals we serve. And so nonprofits, I, I like to call them community innovators because they often are coming in and solving a problem or bringing an opportunity that neither business nor uh, the government provides. And so the community is very much a part of um, the nonprofit itself. And in fact, they, in order to make sure that that nonprofit is fulfilling its mission in a, in a responsible manner and being effective, they have people who are serve as kind of representatives of the community, which is your nonprofit board. And so they have this accountability to be, um, I, I call them agents, right? To ensure that the organization is, is fulfilling its mission. But it's not just the board that has to play a role, right? When we think about nonprofits, we have um, customers, clients, those we serve, um, and we also have um, individuals who provide resources, whether they are volunteers or funders. And so when you think about this ecosystem, nonprofits are very much embedded in the community and therefore um, a, a large part of our sustainability considerations have to think about that community engagement at, at various different levels. So the elements of sustainability I'm gonna speak about today are in these areas, leadership, planning, being mission focused, uh, community engagement and financial help. So let's start with leadership. Um, I know that you had a whole section around um, boards of directors. And so you all are probably well versed in the role of the board um, and how they play that important role of not only ensuring that the nonprofit is fulfilling its mission, but also to help ensure they have the right resources to fulfill that mission. And the board of directors, um, you know, I always put that word independently in there um, because we do wanna make sure that there's no conflicts of interest or other um, uh, factors that could influence a board to perhaps make decisions on behalf of the organization to benefit themselves. Now, when we think about a board of directors, they are perhaps one component of the leadership capacity that a nonprofit has. And I use the word leadership differently than leaders, right? The board is a collective leader of the organization. But um, oftentimes, and for some of your organizations, you might have a, an executive director. And so the board, in essence, delegates 
the management responsibilities of that organization to the nonprofit executive. And so in essence, they have a shared leadership. And that partnership between the executive and the board is a really important one to nurture and to ensure they have uh, the partnership is in place so that they can make decisions uh, in, in a manner that will sustain the organization over time. That means that when we think about nonprofit leadership, think about it almost as a capacity that nonprofits need to have so that they can sustain their organization. And part of having that capacity is ensuring that that capacity continues even when you have people change. Um, and in many cases, nonprofit boards have term limits, which means that the individual who's currently sitting as board chair or the person who's sitting um, at the table may not be the same person five years from now. And if you're uh, planning some long, perhaps some long range planning, how do you ensure that the individuals who might be on the board five years from now are following through on the vision and plan that the current board has? The same is with your executive um, and your senior staff, depending on how many staff you have. How do you ensure that the work that that person is doing today, the skills that they have, the institutional knowledge that they have continues even if they're not there? And so leadership continuity is a really critical component of sustainability. Um, I have to say that one thing that has surprised me is how few nonprofits have a succession plan. And a succession plan in a pandemic seems to me to be one of the key things to have because we never know if somebody could potentially get sick and what, how long they might be out if perhaps not, not able to come back. So that leadership continuity is an important part of succession planning. And that means having some very intentional processes in place, such as a succession plan, such as understanding the expectations of key leadership roles within the organization. And when I talk about roles, I'm thinking about the executive, the board chair, the treasurer, committee chairs, whatever that looks like for your particular organization, understanding what is expected, how do you train and develop individuals so that they're ready to take on those roles, and what is the plan of transition so that if they leave or when they leave, uh, that you have replacement in place and they're trained and ready to go. I love this question and I have to give credit to my friend Justin Pollock from Org Forward because he asked it of my board a couple of years ago, but I think it really does a great job of putting um, the question that we need to ask ourselves and all of the elements of sustainability into one question. Are the assets we share, shepherd? And when we think about assets, it's people, it's um, uh, physical buildings, it's funding, right? All of the different assets that we bring to the table are the assets that we shepherd being invested effectively and efficiently to advance the organization's intended community outcomes in a way that is viable today and into the foreseeable future. So when you look at that question, there's a couple of key words that are walking me into the next couple of sections here. Um, about you know how do we know that the resources that we have are being invested effectively and efficiently? In what way are they directing uh, the community outcomes that we desire? And are we setting ourselves up so that we can do it today, but more importantly for the future? So we think about sustainability. So I'm gonna now talk about each of those sections. First, um, let's talk about the future. And I'd like to start there because when we think about um, sustainability, we have to know where is it that we're headed? What is it we're trying to achieve? How do we get there? And what resources we're going to need to make it happen? And so that's really what a strategic plan does. It's a very focused roadmap, so to speak, to help your organization understand what can be possible and how you can make it possible. Um, in the strategic plan, you have identified what desired outcomes and potentially outputs. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. You, you've clarified the key strategies, the resources and the enablers to make those strategies possible. And of course, then the financial requirements um, or it could even be volunteer requirements or capital requirements. I bundle that all into that you know, requirements. And having that roadmap then guides you down the, down the path. But as with in any trip, sometimes the, you know, your intended uh, course 
may you may have to detour, but at the end of the day, you still end up where you want to go. That's what a strategic plan does. So I encourage you, if you haven't uh, looked at your strategic plan um, after 2020, take a look to see in what way you had to detour and, and, what, and how do you get back on track so that you can stay focused uh, towards your desired goals. Now, I mentioned outcomes and outputs, and um, I bring this up. It's a little, you might say, well, why are we talking about these? But oftentimes, especially I came out of the business world, and um, when we think about outcomes, we think about financial performance, right? But when we're a nonprofit with a mission to create community benefit, to have community impact, we have to think about how do we, how do we measure that, right? How do we know we're being successful? And so um, there are different ways to measure nonprofit success and sustainability. One of them is um, your outputs, right? How many people are you engaging? Um, and and what, um, how many courses, how many individuals receive scholarship funding, for example, those are outputs. But when it comes to truly saying, is my organization being impactful? That's when you get into looking at um, outcomes. In what way has your organization created change, whether it's change in behavior, change in conditions, change in individuals' lives. Those are the um, steps along the way to your journey of having long-term impact. And for a lot of our funding partners, they want to understand how your outcomes, what outcomes you're trying to achieve, and how are you making progress. And so from a sustainability standpoint, being able to tell that story is really important. And then what are the financial requirements that you need to have in place so that you can achieve those outcomes? So some, um, you might have heard the words theory of change. It's the same concept, right? It's what is it we're trying to achieve? How do we measure that we're making progress there? And what are the requirements that we're going to need to, to make that possible? So I'm going to ask you another question. And uh, Linda's going to bring up this next poll which is, if you were a funder, which would you fund? The financial literacy program, which enrolls 500 people this year compared to 400 last year, or a financial literacy program where 75 people avoided eviction from their home compared to 72 last year? Which would you fund? Linda, do we have we the are, results yet? We've got about half people who've voted so far. Okay. We'll give it another minute. Votes are still coming in. I think they're reading and thinking about the question. It's tricky. It's a tough one. It is. That's why I asked it. <laughs> still coming in. Yeah, this time we we uh, we intentionally didn't put a, a not sure, so that's, that's right. It does require yeah. you have to make a choice. <laughs> choice. Right. They've stopped coming in. That looks like well, nope. Here's here's a couple more. All right, we're going to end the poll and share the results now. We've got about seventy-seven people who voted. So about a third, a little over a third, said that they would fund the financial literacy program, which enrolled 500 people this year. And uh, two thirds, again, uh, said that they would fund a program that helps people avoid eviction. And depending on the funding program, they both could be funded. But the second one is more powerful, right? Even though you may have provided some training, it doesn't necessarily mean that that financial literacy training resulted in someone benefiting. But in the second one, you're actually seeing how this program changed lives. Now, it's possible that in order for those 75 people to have benefited from the financial literacy program, they first had to go through the training that is in the number one. So it's when we think about how we communicate to our funders, we, we have to show that we are engaging with our population that we serve or community or whatever the mission is, but then also how do we show that we're truly having impact. I love the video, the spotlight that was shown um, right before um, at the beginning here because it showed how the work that you do transforms children's lives. And that's ultimately why therefore you need to be funded, right? So 
understanding how to communicate and uh, your impact is a real key important component of sustainability. So on to the next component, which is stewarding those financial assets. Um, and I could even add stewarding all of our assets, but having the, um, giving our donors confidence that the resources that they provide to you are being um, appropriately and efficiently and effectively directed towards those outcomes that you're so proud of that you're delivering. And that means having um, those plans and policies, understanding as a board and leadership of where your revenue streams are coming from, which ones are maybe more consistent and stable, and which ones are um, percent potentially either at risk or one-time opportunities that you may not get again. Really understanding what it costs to serve and being able to manage and forecast what your financial position is gonna look like in the future. Um, I have a link there called Manage Cash Flow. For those of you who may not have um, familiarity with a cash flow projection, the Wallace Foundation does um, a great job of outlining that and even has some simple tools. The reason why a cash flow projection is so critical is because it helps you understand whether or not you have enough resources, liquid resources, like liquid assets, to fulfill the mission and the projects and the programs that you want to have. And so that cash flow projection, a lot of times uh, foundations in particular will ask to see uh, a forward cash flow projection. So they know that if they give you this funding that you're still gonna be around um, in the future. And the final piece of your financial you know, management is, is measuring your performance. And for different nonprofits, financial performance measurements may change, but some of the typical ones are um, inflows and outflows, you know, your revenue coming in and your expenses. It could be um, the, uh, the amount of profitability that some of your programs bring in, which help to fund some of your other programs that may not necessarily have direct revenue. So um, we encourage that boards and executives really understand uh, not just where the financial position is today, but what does it look like in the future and how does that compare to the past and your, your expectations. So one of the benefits of a nonprofit is that we also have um, access to a lot of non-cash resources. And so um, I always like to point these out because sometimes we forget to count them in what it really costs to deliver the programs and services that we do. During this pandemic, um, there were a lot of organizations that typically have to rely, that rely on volunteer help to deliver their mission. Think about Meals on Wheels, for example, or uh, senior centers that um, provide um, health checks. And all of a sudden, those volunteers weren't able to help out anymore, but the senior population needed the services more than ever. And so all of a sudden, the nonprofits had to pay staff or hire contractors, additional individuals to deliver those services. And for them, that was an you know, incremental cash outlay that they wouldn't have had they hadn't expected. And, and it really just speaks to how important, you know, volunteer resources and how that adds value. Imagine if you were actually capturing that as a financial metric at, I think, you know, nationally, it's around $27, $28 an hour for uh, volunteer labor. How big would your, would your organization need to be if you had to pay for all of that time and talent? And the same goes for other types of resources that are non-cash, such as partnerships that allow you to quickly access or amplify the work that you do. What would happen if that partnership went away? What would it cost you? So thinking about how can we ensure that we have those financial resources in place to cover the circumstances when we may not be able to access those um, non-cash resources. And that's really where um, you can also help tell that story to your government partners and your donors to really think about how your organization is really efficient and effective because not only do you um, employ people and, and spend money in the economy, which might be important for government um, organizations, but you're able to be really efficient with that donor dollar that because they give you $10, you're able to um, uh, deliver $15 worth of, of services because of the volunteers you have. So really understanding your cost to serve. 
And that's really one of the tricky things that um, oftentimes we see, especially organizations that do have um, a lot of volunteers is, or um, has a lot of programs is that they, they may not really understand the full cost of what it takes to, um, to deliver programs. That it's not just the cost of the staff person who's doing the work or um, the cost of the uh, printing and the marketing. It's also the cost of the audit so that you can give your donors confidence that you've been managing your funding the right way. It's, it's your internet site. It's your, uh, now we're all paying, it's our, tech, it's our Zoom license fees, right? All of those are what are called indirect expenses that really contribute to the full cost of what it is to serve. Sometimes our donors don't understand that and they want to only pay for a piece of what it costs to serve. And that can be troubling and hard for nonprofits if they only get paid for the programs, how do they end up paying for all of the important things that they need to have to help support those programs? And this is where um, a great article that the nonprofit quarterly has, um, and Linda's putting that into the chat, the link, great article that kind of outlines how you can think about the full cost of serve so that when you're out there asking for funding, you're able to say, we need $50,000 of which 40,000 is the you know, staffing to deliver the program. And then this 10% over here is helping to support that program in, in our, in our um, systems and our processes. And um, I, I think that in the past year or two, I'm hearing more and more from funders who are beginning to understand that. And so now you know, we, we, we wanna help our, our donors uh, do the same. But without considering that extra overhead costs, you can get into a cycle that can um, start to deplete your organization. There's some unfortunate case studies out there of large nonprofits that um, only were getting funding for their programs. And over time, they couldn't give professional development. They were not able to offer health benefits. They started laying off staff and eventually they just went out of business. So making sure that we truly understand what it takes to deliver um, our programs, but also what it takes to sustain the organization over time. So um, Bridgespan, there's another link there, does a nice job of talking about that starvation cycle and gives you some considerations of things that need to be put in place so that you can sustain your organization. Got to give a plug for professional development. Um, oftentimes when we start to look at our budgets and where budgets are looking tight, one of the things we cut is training and workshops. Well, I give you all credit for ensuring that you are available to participate today. It's not just about the cost of attending a conference. It's also the time that you allow that employee to take time off to go and get that extra training. It not only refreshes their brain, but hopefully it brings back new innovative opportunities that can help grow your organization. So um, at Dana, we believe professional development funding is, is a critical necessity. Just like you pay to have an accountant, you wanna make sure you pay also to uh, sustain your, um, your staff and, and their ability to perform and, and innovate for the future. So we've talked about leadership, we've talked about planning, we've talked about outcomes, we've talked about kind of this you know, understanding the cost to serve now we're going to talk about how do you bring the two together? How do you bring your, your money resources together and your mission? And that can be tricky because one, we report them in different ways, right? We have all of our accounting software and we know exactly what our balance sheet looks like, but our outcomes sometimes are difficult. And how do we make sure that when we are looking at the resources we have, we're deploying them in the most efficient, effective way? And um, a great resource called Sustainability Mindset by Jeannie Bell and Steve Zimmerman. I encourage all nonprofits to use it. They have free templates that help you actually see how does my funding sources and my expenses link to my mission areas and where am I um, lifting the organization up and where may I be spending time and resources and money in some areas that are not necessarily lifting up our mission. And so um, a great way to kind of connect mission and money and to visually see how the two work together and, and then hopefully make you know, really good decisions around how you deploy your resources in the future. 
The next area is really about, you know, I've talked a lot about what organizational centric stuff is really looking at how the community is engaged with your organization and your mission. This is, you know, coming back to that nonprofit ecosystem. It's looking at how do we ensure the community continues to invest, the community continues to find value in what we do and therefore prioritizes the work we do when it comes to their um, funding and resourcing. And so there's a couple of things I've listed here that you can see are, are factors in engaging the community. One is having a good brand reputation. And that's through telling your story, showing the successes that you've been able to do, uh, giving the community confidence that your organization is reliable in fulfilling its mission and outcomes. Having those friend raisers and fundraisers are certainly um, an important part for those organizations that do boots on the ground um, and connect people with the great work they do. Donor stewardship, and I'm sure you're probably going to hear about some of that today. Uh, how do you how do you not just receive the money in, but how do you involve the donor in the life and the mission of the work that you do in a way that they continue to find value and pride in being a supporter of your organization. Advocacy and public policy. There's um, a myth out there that nonprofits should not uh, be lobbying and working with government, and that is so far from true. Um, many times the work that we do is transforming lives. They, they are impacted communities and, and, and government is an important partner, both in helping to solve problems in communities, but also they're an important funding resource and um, can um, also pass legislation that could be barriers for the work that you wanna do. So um, having a good advocacy and public policy um, plan in place is important. And finally, I just can't stress how important it is that um, partnerships. As nonprofits, we are not the only ones that are going to be able to solve the problems that we're trying to solve, right? When you think about some of the children and youth that you support, oftentimes there may be other types of support systems that they are benefiting from. Imagine if you are connecting into them in some way could lead to new possibilities for how your organization can create value and um, support those youth in the future. So partnerships um, and stewarding those partnerships, uh, just like you steward a donor, um, um, equally important. <laughs> so when we um, wrap it all up, and I wanted to make sure that I uh, left some time for uh, questions, um, it's sustainability is, is about having leadership and understanding that continuity of your leadership, having that plan for the future, your ability to measure your mission outcomes, really understanding the true costs so that you don't fall into that starvation cycle, understanding what that future is gonna need from a cash flow standpoint, and then you know, investing in the community so that they help support those, uh, the work that you do so that your cash uh, flows forward and not, and not backwards. So <clears throat> I'm coming back to that question that I asked at the very beginning. And I'd like to get your thoughts now. Should you lead a nonprofit like a business? And Linda, I'm not sure if it, <clears throat> how are we doing on the answer there? Can you, yeah, no one has voted yet. Can you, could anyone see the poll? It's, at, it's actually at the results page and not at the oh. voting page. Okay, hold on one second. Thank you. You're welcome. There, there we go. go. That's better. <laughs> Should you lead a nonprofit like a business? How are we doing with the uh, responses, Linda? Yeah, we have about 60% uh, of the folks that vote, about 22. Any more votes? Going once, going twice. All right, let's share what we have. Okay, so interesting. We have less 
non we have no not sures, whereas before we did. And looks like we're kind of about two thirds again, a little almost three quarters at yes, and 32% at no. So here's the thing. I, I think it's an and, right? I think you need to lead a nonprofit like a business and you also have other things you have to do on top of it to sustain it. Um, I've run companies, $100 million companies, and I can tell you that running a nonprofit is hard work, but boy, is it really rewarding. And so, yes, um, you've got to run it as a business. It is a business. You're bringing in funding, you pay people, you have all of the same responsibilities of business, and on top of it, you're accountable to the community and all of the work that we need to do to help ensure that we're mindful and, and delivering on the results that the community has uh, commissioned us to do. And that is my take on nonprofit uh, sustainability. Uh, so with that, I'll stop sharing and um, see if there are any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sheila. That was terrific. Really enjoyed that. I'm going to I'm going to get the Q&A started while everybody's thinking about their questions. And I'm going to throw one out to you um, at this point. Where do you think I mean, you've got vast amount of experience with numbers of nonprofits. Where do you think nonprofits most often stumble when it comes to reaching a sustainable position? What I've seen, and I particularly uh, last year, because um, you know when the pandemic hit and so many organizations were not able to uh, implement their fundraisers like they traditionally did, we um, we found that there was a sizable number of organizations that didn't really understand how much cash they had left or what their cash position is, and and so I tend to bring that up a lot. It's it's it sounds very much like an accounting issue, but it. But if, if you're not able to say, we've got five months of cash left, mm -hmm. what are we going to do with it? Or two months of cash. It, it, you know, you, you're you not in a position then to make good decisions. Right. And, and when I talk about cash flow and, and this Wallace Foundation will, you know, breaks it apart, it's your unrestricted cash. You mm -hmm. know, when I do um, financial, you know, training with, with nonprofit boards, you know, one of the things that's so different about a nonprofit versus a company is that you can have a million dollars in the bank and not be able to make payroll. Right. Because you have money that is set aside for a specific purpose. And so when we think about cash flow projection, it's really understanding what is our unrestricted cash flow position? Are we going to be able to make payroll? Um, if we are, you know, are we going to be able to pay our rent if, for example, we lost a major funder? So to me, that's a that's an area that I think. Um, because QuickBooks does not really have a cash flow projection tool, mm -hmm. it's something you have to create on your own. And I think that's probably maybe one reason why we don't see it as, as much. We certainly saw some of that with, um, with the pandemic as well, with the organizations that may or may not have had any contingency or as you say, cash flow, unrestricted cash. Do you, do you ever give a sort of a ballpark. One of the questions I get asked all the time is, well, how much should we have? You know, do we need three months, six months, two years, et cetera? Where do you usually, you know, come in with regard to that type of unrestricted cash balance? I, I always start with, it depends. Uh, <laughs> and, and the reason why is uh, some nonprofits are very um, seasonal. I, I think about, um, I happen to live at the beaches in Southern Delaware. So we have arts organizations and cultural organizations where all of their funding comes in a three month window. Yeah. And so for them, they need to have at least nine to 12 months of cash by the time the summer ends to hold them over until the following year. Exactly. An organization that routinely gets um, revenue and think of like um, a private school, right? That has tuition that's coming in and it's pretty predictable. What, you know, then maybe you don't need as much but um, you, you have to almost think about what are those costs that if you didn't, if you didn't get any revenue in, you still have to pay, such mm -hmm. as your staff, your, your rent. So one way to look at it is how much would you need to, to cover enough months, months, days, however you want to manage it, that you would be able to do something about it to get, the, get replenished. So um, 
four, six months. Most nonprofits nationally um, average around four months and people are shocked by that. But um, one of the things that I saw as a statistic when the pandemic first hit is a lot of small businesses often only have um, one to two months of cash. So um, from a stewardship standpoint, and because we are responsible for community resources and community assets, the more you can you can build up the better. And it might be that you know each year you set aside a certain portion of your net uh, income that comes in that you put it aside as a, a, a you know a, an unrestricted fund right. that the board designates, and then you've got that you know in case something happens. So it actually becomes part of your budgeting. You've got a line in there for some, you know, rainy day um, control. Uh, yeah. Linda, do we, I'm sorry. Linda, do we have other questions? We do. Ah. First one, how do you get nonprofits comfortable with spending some money on support infrastructure beyond the program costs? <laughs> we are <laughs> our own worst enemies, aren't we? Um, I, I guess this is what I say. If you want to get funding, you have to be able to show your outcomes. To show your outcomes, you're going to have to do research. If you want to have excellent programs that deliver excellent, pro, uh, excellent outcomes, you're going to have to pay excellent wages. If you want to be innovative, you're going to have to create conditions so that people can learn, develop, and experiment. All of those are not direct program costs, but are critical to being seen as a leader. Um, in, in the community. And, um, and it, it's, uh, again, our funding community is willing to pay for that. We just often don't remember to ask. We don't say we want to launch this new program and say, and we're adding in an extra 10% so the staff can get training. We just ask for the program money. So um, I'd say start asking and see what happens. Thank you. One more. What are some of your go-to best practices that you use in stewarding your donors? Oh, <laughs> oh, we have another hour for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have, I've worked in nonprofits that had different kinds of funding models. Um, Dana is primarily uh, grant and program fees and not necessarily individual donors. And then when I was at the Art League, we had a lot of individual donors. Um, I start with first, you know, you know, understanding why your donor is interested in your organization, and then follow up with the stories to show them how their dollars, their contributions are really making a difference. Depending on um, whether they're a major gift donor or um, somebody who even gives twenty dollars, you may find that the stewardship varies um, <clears throat> based upon um, uh, the the level investment, but but at the end of the day, you know, when we give money, I know that when I give money, I want to know that what I'm giving is going to a good cause. Mm -hmm. And when I get a you know a note in the mail or an email that shares a story about how this organization is making an impact, I feel good about it. But I also feel good when they give me a call and say, "How was your experience?" Like when I was at the art league, or um, are there things that you think we could be doing differently? So it's not just about mission outcome support, but how do you engage them in your organization? Um, and ultimately, maybe they may be a good uh, board member down the road. There you go. Thank you. And we have one final question, which is how do we talk about sustainability with new board members? Mm. Uh, let me show you. How do we talk about sustainability with new board new members? New board members. Well, I'm a big believer that um, every board member should be ready at the first board meeting to be able to engage in a constructive dialogue and uh, vote with great knowledge, right? So it starts with your orientation process and how are you educating that board member on what, um, what all it takes for your organization to be sustainable over time. Do you, you know, are you sharing with them that strategic plan so they know what the future looks like? Do they understand your revenue streams, your key expense areas, where, where things are um, volatile and what's less risky? And how can they as a board member help support the sustainability organization? In what way can they add their value and contribute their skills and knowledge and expertise and networks to help support the, the organization in the future? Great, thank you. That's, that's it for the questions.
Excellent, excellent. Let's give Sheila a virtual round of applause. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. Oh, oh, it's been great to have you. And uh, I really appreciate all of all of your pearls of wisdom that you shared with the group. And I'm sure everybody like myself was taking copious notes. So thanks. Thanks a lot. Sheryl, for being with us. You're welcome. All right, everybody.